thanks of God, but I'm just glad to be in the service one more time because he didn't have to let me live. And because he allowed me to live, I came into the house of the Lord today, not to work, but to indeed worship him and glorify him and give his name praise, both from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same. I greet each and every one of you in the only name that matters tonight, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. The time may have changed, but God is indeed the same. For as Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 8 says, God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. I ask that you open up your Bibles to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, commencing at the 16th verse and concluding at the 18th verse. It is indeed a very short passage of scripture, but it is very powerful in its presentation. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, reading from the New King James Version of the Scripture, then followed up by the voice translation. It says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Reading from the voice translation, it says, Celebrate always, pray constantly, and give thanks to God no matter what circumstances you find yourself in. This is God's will for all of you in Jesus, the Anointed One. Tonight, saints of God, I want to talk about staying in the will of God. Staying in the will of God. Because as a child of God, you must recognize and realize the spiritual truth and reality that God wants us to prove ourselves in Him on a daily basis. And if we are going to appropriately prove ourselves in the God of our salvation, we must stay in the will of God and be grounded in the things of God. And Paul right here in verses 16 through 18 of the fifth chapter of the book of First Thessalonians is letting us know flat out easily how we can stay in the will of God. Because the spiritual truth in reality, it's as easy, Sister Wyndham, as one, two, three. For he says in the Bible, the word of God, in this particular pericope, that we are supposed to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in everything, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. Now, I know what a lot of my educators are asking me, especially my beloved trustee, Gloria Jackson. She is saying, well, pastor, what is the will of God? And I would have you to know that you are asking a pertinent question even from your home tonight, Trustee Jackson. Because the will of God are, is the wants, the desires, the wishes, and the expectations that God has for his children. And you must know as a child of God, as the model goes, the will of God will never lead you where the grace of God cannot keep you. And you ought to want to fulfill the divine expectations 
and dictates that God has for your life individually and corporately on a daily basis. Now, I was as I was driving to the church just a few seconds ago, picking justice up from basketball practice at King High School, I remembered when my wife and I used to do marital counseling for those individuals who were prospective individuals to get married. One of the first and key things that she would say to them, Brother Parham, is that when you get married, you should have no expectations. Because all of your expectations will literally fly out the window. Because what you want, what you desire, is not going to always transpire. But you got to know, my friends, that when it comes to the will of God and the implications that he has for your life, you must get in alignment with him and you must have the right mood and the right proper perspective at all times, 24 hours and seven days a week. Because the mood that ought to be set as a child of God, if you're going to stay in the will of God, is number one, your number one priority ought to be to magnify his holy name. Because as I told you on last week, God is good even on a bad day. And there should never be a time where you are not worshiping him both in spirit and in truth. Because I don't know how many of you would agree with me tonight, but God wants you to grow in the Lord always. Again, I say grow. Am I right about it, church? Some of you are shaking my head. That's not what God desires for us. He does not want us to grow because God has been too good for us, for us to be out here grumbling. No, the Bible, the word of God says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 4 that God wants us to rejoice in the Lord. Always again, I say rejoice. And we can't just rejoice. Paul emphatically says in that fourth verse, in the fourth chapter of Philippians, we got to do it in the Lord. Because he is the only one who allows us to rejoice even in the midst of ridicule, chaos, and confusion. So let the church say, we must magnify his name. But secondly, if we want to be in the right mood as it pertains to the master, we must move in his direction. We must move in his direction. Because we have been repeatedly talking about prayer over the last few weeks in Bible study. Therefore, we should know as a memory verse what James chapter 4 in verse number 8 clearly says. And that is that God wants us to draw near to him. Because if we draw near to God, God will draw near to us as well. Because as you have heard me say before, prayer is the necessary link between the divine hand that gives and the human heart that receives. You can gain strength from just praying and seeking the face of God. Because when you do all of that by faith, you recognize that your life and your plans are in God's hands. You have to be one who magnifies the Lord. You have to move in his direction. And last but not least, God will have you to know that you have to be mindful of him. You have to keep him at the forefront of your mind all day and every day because you cannot allow that adversary to creep in 
and to take your God conscious and mindset away from you. You are to be thankful to God in everything because you know ultimately he is the one who causes you to triumph in him. For he has said that if you follow him, you will be victorious even as you go through the valley experiences that you got to go through because yea, though you may walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are confident of the fact that God is with you and you are mindful that he is a very present help in the time of trouble and that he has also furthermore said that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, saints of God, I got to be honest with you today. I do not like annual days. Days like Easter, days like Christmas, and days like Men's or Women's Day, because you got to indeed preach from a particular text. And I thought that I was only going to do one Christmas message during this particular Advent season. But God had to set me straight. He had to let me know that I am the shepherd. And you are the under shepherd. And you will speak the things that I want you to speak. So as I indeed ask God, what is it that you would have me to do to bring you glory and to make sure that my life is in alignment with him? He gave me one particular word. And as I thought about that word and and he prayed and put into principle these practices that Paul is talking about in verses 16 through 18 of the fifth chapter of First Thessalonians. I had to pray and say, God, what is this that you would have me to say? Because I don't want to be repetitive. How much more can we talk about the coming of Christ? And he said that if you pray to me, I'll give you something fresh. And you gotta come and approach me in prayer with that right attitude. You gotta come rejoicing and thanking God that you have the accountability and the responsibility to declare God's word in season and out of season to my people. And as I rejoiced and thank God, wherever I was writing the messages at, that's my business, nobody else's. God spoke to me and gave me not only one message, but he gave me two messages. And then he challenged me so much and said, I want you to give your administrative assistant the title to a message that you haven't even wrote yet. But I'm giving you the scripture. And don't you believe I got that scripture done and that text done and that sermon done when I woke up this morning and indeed it was indeed done and finished. All three messages by 11 o'clock. Because God wants you to know, my friends, hear me today. Wake up and write it down. When joy and prayer are married and come together, their first child would be gratitude. I think I just said something. When joy and prayer come together as one. There can't help but for its first child to be gratitude. And I tell you, while the pressure was on me, when I submitted to the will of God, I had to indeed, at my desk, shout and say, go ahead and speak to me, Lord. And somebody came by my office and said, who in the world are you talking to, Mr. Jones? And I'm saying, I'm talking to my boss because he gave me an assignment and I fulfilled that particular assignment 
even when it was against my own will. God will have you to do things for him that are against your own will. But in order for it to come to pass, you got to be able to submit to his sovereignty and let God have his own way in and through your life. And you got to be able to say, like Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, one of my favorite texts, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Church, are y'all in here with me today? It may be the reason you don't understand that every day is a day of thanksgiving is because you are the one who is responsible from divorcing your joy from your prayers. But you got to put them together at all times. And you got to say to the adversary, Brother Parham, that this joy that I have, the world didn't give it. And the world surely can't take it away. Do I have a witness in this house? Because as we will see later on, I can't be thankful for everything. I can't be thankful for the diagnosis that my doctor has given me. I can't be thankful for having to go and see my child or to see my nephew in a casket. But I can give him thanks in everything because I know that God is at work in my life nevertheless. So if you want to stay in the will of God, God wants you to know it's as simple as one, two, Three, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in everything, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Now, my sixth grade teacher will have an argument with me because she told me way back in the day that whenever you see a true and false question, Wendy, as an educator, Whenever you see that, you can automatically mark it as false because nothing is always and forever. But I got an argument with her biblically because the Bible, the word of God says in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number eight, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Oh yes, I know how you're looking at me. You want to join my teacher and say, it's hard to pray always. I get tired. It's hard to be in the mood of having a yet praise in the midst of all of the painful predicaments that I'm in on a daily basis. Well, guess what? You can still implement these three wholly helpful hints that I gave you because somebody in here knows that all of your help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And he has promised never to leave you nor forsake you. Therefore, with him on your side, God will never allow you to go down because God wants you to know that there is nothing too hard for him when you have a hallelujah, anyhow, type of attitude and mindset about your situation. When you hand everything over to him and you allow him to move mightily in your life and you have a hands-off approach and you say to the God of your salvation, this is too much for me to bear. Therefore, I need you to show up and show yourself strong in the midst of my situation and because you have not failed me yet I know in the end I'm going to win because God is the one who causes us to triumph yeah, yeah, yeah. but you got to be able to head in God's direction because he surely wants you to go to higher heights in him thus if you indeed implement these three practical points in your daily faith walk with God, you will never be shaken again by the storms and the situations that he puts you in, Sister Campbell, to bring him more glory. 
because you are assured of one thing. If you stand on the word of God and remember that you belong to him exclusively, he will be standing right by your side every step of the way. And I think I have some witnesses in this house who can testify to that spiritual truth and reality. Amen. Hence, God wants you to know as verse number 19 says, and I didn't mean to go there, but God just dropped this in my spirit. It says, don't suppress the spirit. Do not quench the spirit by any means. You have to go out there and have an individual, personal worship experience and an encounter with God. Because you ought to be growing in him and moving closer to him on a daily basis. Because when you delight yourself in the Lord, Psalm 37 and verse number 4 says that God will grant you the desires of your heart. His church, during this Thanksgiving season, we need to be out here giving thanks unto the God of our salvation for all that he has done for us down through the years. Because as a child of God, God would have you to know it shouldn't be just a cute ditty. God wants you to worship him in spirit and in truth and let the church say my worship must be for real and when your worship is for real you are going to always be grounded in the things of God and be out to please him first and foremost even though fiery darts may be thrown your way on a daily basis because you know, as John 10 and 10 says, that the devil may have come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But God has come so that you can have life and have it more abundantly. For he is calling us to joy. And this is surely his will for our lives without question and without doubt no matter how difficult the road may be that he would have us to walk down but we can't afford to veer off of the road just because times are tough no we have to stay on the path that God has purposed and ordained for our life give him thanks keep on praying and be rejoiceful because we know that God is at work in our life and he will give us the strength to go through it. Well, you quote that scripture. Steph Curry was here the other night on Monday night. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. And God is just letting us know you're in it to win it. Because he's right by your side. And he's equipped you. He has empowered you. And he is going to enable you to stand even when the storms of life are raging. In short, Daniel, when he says in verses 16 through 18, these three practical principles, he is letting us know that this is a Christian's code of conduct. That this is how you are supposed to govern your life if you are going to truly be a follower, a disciple, and a student of Jesus Christ. So let me tell you what the will of God is once again. I told you earlier that it is the desires of God, the expectations of God, the wants of God, and what God requires out of us. To, and what we need to be about as the people of God, as we seek to live out our lives, not for ourselves, but we seek to live it for Christ Jesus. In short, here it is. Let me put it to you another way. It is God's thoughts and inclinations towards us. 
Let the church say, the will of God, will of God is God's God. thoughts and inclinations towards us. Yes, the will of God, this is what God has divinely determined should be done in each and every one of our lives, both individually and corporately. And in all actuality, church, the choice is his. Because remember, he made us and not we ourselves. We are the sheep of his pasture. And the only thing that God wants us to do, if we truly want him to give us the power to prevail, since it is his choice and his divine dictates for our lives, the only thing that God wants us to do is comply to him. Comply. Get in alignment with him and stop complaining. Therefore, church, we need to practice these precepts and follow his commands with every breath we take and with every move we make. For one thing is for sure, God is in it for us to win it. Therefore, we got to be able to trust God even when we cannot trace him. Thus, my objective tonight in this Bible study is simply this. In tonight's teaching, you will personally and spiritually discover tonight that God is expecting for us to maintain a God conscious and mindset about whatever we may face in life. For he should always be in the forefront of our minds and our thoughts. That's why I gave you those three moods earlier. And what were the first things that I told you? Sister Jackie Campbell was a few minutes late. I said, you got to move in his direction. You got to be mindful of him at all times. And you must magnify his name. So the first will of God principle that I want to talk about tonight is we must rejoice always. And the first point that I want to lay in your lap in this Bible study teaching is God wants us to regularly rejoice in the Lord. God wants us to regularly rejoice in the Lord. For as I told you earlier, Philippians 4 and 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord. Always, again, I say rejoice. And as a child of God, when you are truly on the go for God, you are going to have to get filled up with his power on a daily basis so that you can keep from losing your mind. Now that Justice is on the basketball team and is at a different high school than Zion, I have to rip and run down Larner, Lafayette, Jefferson, 75 in the Lodge. And that means I got to go to the filling station more and more. And when God has given you responsibilities, you got to be accountable to him and you got to know that he has anointed you for whatever adversity that you may face in life. Therefore, instead of throwing in the towel, God wants you to give him thanks and know that he is at work in your life and you can't just make a declaration that I'm going to have joy. You got to show him firsthand that as I said on Friends and Family Day, you are not going to let anything or anybody get between Jesus and you. 
Because he has invested too much in you for you to give up and quit. That's why you got to have a hallelujah, anyhow, type of attitude and mindset about your situation and say, everything in my life may be in shambles, yet will I rejoice. Because I know in the end, I'm going to win. And through even my losses, God is trying to teach me something new about him. Growing up, I used to hear the preacher say that I wouldn't have a religion that I couldn't feel. Somebody complete my statement sometimes. Therefore, as the people of God, we surely got a reason to rejoice. Because I don't think anybody in this room would argue with me tonight, live or online. God is sitting on the throne. And God is taking care of his own. And if God is in the proper place in our life, and we're poised in position, we ought to have joy, even in the midst of chaos and confusion, even in the midst of contrary winds coming our way, because we are completely convinced that whatever God is causing to transpire in our life, is going to eventually make us complete in him because we were built to withstand whatever comes our way when we stand on the word of God and worship him in spirit and in truth because praise is what we ought to do no matter if we are happy or sad. We ought to therefore subsequently go all out and shout with the voice of triumph and shout with the voice of praise, even when we are going through trials and tribulations. And that is what Paul is saying right here in the 16th verse. Rejoice always. Don't think about your situation. Think about the God of your situation and the God of your salvation. And I want you to have a Psalm 121 type of mentality. I want you, when problems become prevalent and relevant in your life, I don't want you to look down in despair. I want you to be able to look to the hills from which cometh your help, knowing that all of your help comes from the Lord. For the good news is, while our circumstances change, God will never change. And I done gave you Hebrews 13 and 8 two times already, so I don't have to repeat that. Because as Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse number 10 says, God wants you to know the joy of the Lord is your strength. And beloved, that fact alone ought to cause you to rejoice and be exceedingly glad in the God of your salvation, no matter what your situation is, and have a whole lot of a bunch of joy. Because unlike happiness, you don't need anything to happen to have joy. Because happiness is based on what is happening. Now, tomorrow is... Luana's birthday. And if I don't come correct, <laughs> thank you, Jesus. She won't be happy. <laughs> and she said, I won't either. But guess what? Even if I didn't do a thing for her, she ought to still have joy. Because on July 13th, 2003, whatever it is, she became a Jones, 2002, you're right. <laughs> so, it's a difference between happiness and joy. Because if God doesn't do another thing for me, I can indeed raise my ten fingers and say, he's done enough. Am I the only one in this house who can say, he's done enough? But the truth of the matter is, if I just think about the goodness of Jesus, 
I got to stand up. I got to shout. And I got to salute his holy name no matter what. If my situation is good, bad, or ugly. For as David said in Psalm 34, in verse number one, I will bless the Lord at all times. To cut a long story short, I don't know about you, but I just can't stop praising his name. For God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. No wonder in Matthew chapter 2 and verse number 20, I didn't preach on this, I didn't write a uh, Christmas sermon on this, but in Matthew 2 and 20, it says, When the Magi saw the star, they rejoiced and were exceedingly glad. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 12, God wants us to know that we can indeed get our praise on even in the midst of persecution. Because he told us in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are you when men shall revile you, persecute you, and talk all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. For great will your reward be in heaven. It says in Luke chapter 15 and verse number 5, where we will indeed be talking about in uh, the third Sunday of November in our series of sermons on the lost and found, we have to know that God will indeed leave the 99 behind and look for the one that is lost. And when he was giving that particular parable, he was saying that the owner cares for the sheep. Because of carelessness, he will indeed throw a party. And guess who the rejoice over us when we are redeemed. Uh, my Holy Ghost, all he, the main singer at God wants to rejoice over you. Me. My son, has been found. Because as a child of God, quickly, right? Because he'll make whatever is wrong in your life. place to let your kingdom come and let your will that I can really rejoice always as a going to always To rejoice is, I'm going to thrive on thrive under his leadership and guidance. That's why I can say earlier, the will of God will never lead you. Messages, but God said, if you get yourself in alignment, mm -hmm. things that you never knew. Mm -hmm. So I can't wait till December. I might even mm -hmm. given us a relevant word about the coming 
of Christ in our life. Secondly, that's God in all things. And we God in all things. And thirdly, because he is going to cause me to triumph chapter 2 and verse number I am so thankful to God who always the voice translation and through us he spreads the God is the one and a conqueror through him, through Christ Jesus. Therefore, stop Christ. For the Bible, the word is and the finisher of our faith who for the joy at the right hand of the Father making enter we let you know tonight When I because I have vowed to praise him no matter if I am happy you remember how it was You were constantly thinking about them. They were on your mind. To let you know I was thinking about you. And that is goodness. We ought to be consumed with his Because you know for yourself that if it had place, then he goes Now I know that you getting tired of me. We have to pray continuously and pray always. Because Luke 18, they faint not. Yes, God doesn't and believe in Him continually. give you the power to persevere. Persevere and persistently pray. Let the persistent pray. As you say, Dick